All right, welcome back. This is Computer Science 164. This is lecture one, and today we actually dive into all things related to design, some of the technical things we'll be doing throughout this semester, and giving you a sense of where you'll be headed for your very first project. So recall from last week that we'll have weekly labs. We're still finalizing times and place with the registrar folks, but for now we will have labs, uh, let's say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 6 to 8 p.m. This is in Pierce 301. It's the top floor of Pierce, which is at the engineering school. It's a really nice new space that fits about 40, 50 people all at open workspaces and you bring your laptop, you bring your power cord and these will be hands-on opportunities to not only experiment with some of the ideas of the week but also for one-on-one -on -one design guidance for multiple teaching fellows that will be staffing each of these. Um, they are optional and the lab activities that you do during these things will be placed online so that if you and or your partner can't make some week or any week, realize that you can still follow along uh, at your leisure on your own. So ideas. So the first project and the third project are going to be assigned by us, the staff. But the second and fourth projects, recall, are up to you to choose, whereby you and your partner will decide over the next few weeks exactly what mobile web app you would like to make, what mobile iOS app you would like to make, propose it to us by the dates on the syllabus. We'll give you then some feedback, and then you'll be off for that three or four week period implementing it. If you would like, though, to post ideas for classmates, or if you've just got so many ideas that you want at least someone to go do it, um, do feel free to post to this website here. We made a new mobile category. And just over the weekend, we actually solicited ideas from staff and faculty all across campus. So you might see a lot of folks from outside of the class posting ideas. Um, what we've told departments is that for those choice projects, you are quite welcome to collaborate with one or more administrators or tech people on campus. For instance, if you work for some department uh, or even some student group that has an actual problem that they would like solved in a mobile context, that's fine if you're actually delivering a product to a group or department that would actually use it, so long as the work is primarily that of you and your uh, partner. It's certainly fine, though, for the staff or even student group leaders to provide you with the so-called uh, design or business requirements of the app if your project might actually then solve something useful on campus. So realize that is encouraged and allowed. All right, so a little warm up. What we'll do today is look at some things very specific to mobile, but then we'll take a step back and talk more generally about how you can implement uh, well-designed web-based applications. And along the way, we'll introduce some terminology, some jargon, and also some of the technologies you'll be using over the semester. So one sort of softball question at first, if only to get things flowing. Um, so there's this dichotomy right now in the world of mo uh, web apps versus native apps. And someone want to just toss out a layman's definition of these two? What's the distinction? Yeah. Perfect. So a web app is something implemented in HTML, JavaScript, CSS typically, and it's meant to run inside of a web browser, whether it's on an iPhone or Android or BlackBerry or Windows mobile phone. It's meant to execute within the confines of a browser. So to use that app, you have to obviously pull up a URL or follow some link to get to it. And a native app, by contrast, is something you would actually download from Apple Store, from an Android store, from Amazon, or whatever the me delivery mechanism is for your particular uh, operating system. You can download compiled apps, and those compiled apps are typically written in uh, languages like Java, or in the case of iOS, uh, Objective-C, and you have to, like you did, say, in CS50, compile the source code you write, actually then upload it to someone else's server, click a link in some app store, and voila, now you have compiled code. So who cares? Why the distinction? And right now, and probably at least for the next couple of years, this is kind of uh, the first design decision you have to make if you're trying to make something for mobile devices. What design decisions or requirements might push you toward one or the other? Just based on your own consumer understanding of these two things. Yeah? Okay, so it's a little easier to use a native app on your phone, right? You push a button and it's there. You don't have to open Safari or whatever the browser is. You don't have to type in a URL. You don't have to find a, a link. You just push the button and it's there. So that's compelling? Yeah? It's a little more involved to update a native app because you have to sort of submit it to maybe a store and then have the consumer click on it, whereas a web app you can just keep updating. Perfect. So there's a downside to native apps come with these hurdles, particularly in Apple's case, which is a little vigilant or excessively so when it comes to approving or disapproving apps for the store. So that's to roll out uh, new updates or new programs altogether, you need someone else's blessing. Thankfully, Apple's gotten better over the past couple of years about rolling out updates quickly, but you do need still someone else's involvement. Yeah, I'm back. OK, 
Okay, perfect. So web apps, though, by contrast, work anywhere and, in fact, on multiple devices, not just the one that you had in mind that we would be using. Other thoughts? Yeah? Yeah, I agree. And this one's a little harder to sort of ex explain why. But definitely right now, I do think there's this mindset where native apps just are, are cooler. They're sexier. They're, they're more real in that you actually do have to go through some process of downloading it. And the funny thing is, on Android phones and on iPhones, you might not have ever done this, but almost always you can open the browser, visit some mobile website, and then click one of the icons on the bottom is, and then say, add icon to home screen, or whatever the text is. And then you actually have what appears then to be a native application. In fact, on iOS, OS, when you do that and add a bookmark to your home screen and then touch the icon, they'll even remove the Safari address bar. So it actually looks like an actual app, but this just isn't done all that often. Yeah. So very true. If you want to make money, you kind of have to go through um, an app store, at least in the iOS case where they require that you go through them. Um, so they take their 30% cut. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there's the publicity aspect of it. There's like the top apps categories, right? The, inter the World Wide Web is a huge place, but the app store is at least a little more narrowly defined. So if you sort of hit it right and get something out there that people like, you sort of get these nice mushroom effects. But what about more technologically? Like what's compelling about native over web app? Yeah. OK, so you have better performance. You have access to native hardware, things like hardware acceleration for graphics in particular. In fact, most of the fanciest games you've been playing these days, with some exceptions, have been native because they're really uh, designed to run on the actual hardware. Yeah? Definitely. Perfect. And we'll see this right, uh, quite soon today, whereby you can mimic the UI of an Android phone, an iPhone, Windows Mobile We're using CSS and JavaScript and HTML, but it's just not quite as polished. And if you're trying to make something that people really like and really maybe want to pay for, these kinds of things can be compelling. And one other I'll toss out there, too, um, is that you get access to more features in the hardware. Typically, when using a native uh, application, you can use the accelerometer, if applicable, or the gyroscope, or the compass, or any number of other hardware specific features that increasingly are becoming more exposed to JavaScript <laughs> in browsers, either natively by the browser or via various frameworks that we'll talk about over the course of the semester. But that, too, is kind of compelling. If you want to use the accelerometer, you kind of have to go with some kind of native app. All right, so that's, that's the stage. Now some of the constraints. So this is just a little screenshot from Apple's documentation. And this kind of goes without saying. The screens are smaller, right? So on the one hand, this is nice in that you have to design less screen real estate, but it's also fairly confining in that you have to interact with the lowest common denominator, which is going to be a user's finger of some sort. And you actually have to confine your user interface to be easy to use. And that's definitely been the theme here. So one of the things we'll talk about over the course of the semester is also what you should be keeping in mind when it comes to designing good software from a user experience perspective. So what does it mean to make a mobile web app? Let's get some definitions out of the way. So here is a mobile web app. If you go to m.harvard.edu in your uh, iOS phone or BlackBerry or uh, what not. Um, it kind of looks like a mobile app. Why? Well, it's just because whoever made this application used Photoshop and designed icons that were like 57 pixels by 57 pixels. Someone wrote some CSS that put enough padding or margins around each of those clickable anchor tags so that it looks like it's actually a mobile app, but in fact, a mobile native app. But in reality, all you're doing is using sort of age old tricks in HTML that you might have been using for years to just make something that fits on a screen. And in fact, you could make a mobile web app just by firing up Chrome or whatever browser you have on your own computer, opening gedit or notepad or whatever text editor you have, and just start writing HTML coupled with some CSS. And then if you really want to get fancy, you can do things like JavaScript. And even though this here is just a screenshot, recall that on last Monday, I did pull up this iOS simulator. For those of you with Macs, realize that as part of the first staff project, you'll be able to download this for free, assuming you have a Mac that's running Lion. But if you don't yet have a Mac or won't be having a Mac during the semester, realize that it won't be until Monday, March 19th, I think we say on the course's website, that you'll actually need a Mac. The first half of the course can be done on most any platform. So let's go pull up Safari here. Let's go and pull up, uh, let's see, a new window here, new page. And here is m. Dot, oh, all caps, m.harvard.edu. Let's see what happens. 
and voila. So there it is. So in fact, this is actually cached. There was a nice little design feature of harvard.edu, um, whereby if you actually go, actually, maybe it wasn't m.harvard.edu. Let me try this once more and see if I can have a nice pedagogical point. Harvard.edu. There it is. Stand by. Not the way to implement a mobile website. <laughs> okay. So what happened there? So it was appearing to load the main Harvard website, www.harvard.edu. And then it apparently decided, wait a minute, let me not download all of these tens of kilobytes. And let me redirect the user to m.harvard.edu, which is what I accidentally manually typed in the first place. So this is um, not all that uncommon as to this redirection. And we'll come and look at, underneath the hood, how you can actually do even the simplest of things there. And I dare say there's so many sites out there that don't do this properly. If you read like Google News, and uh, on your phone, just news.google.com and click through a lot of these links. Very often, I at least will be redirected to the mobile version of whatever news site has their article linked there. And then I don't even end up at the article I clicked on because someone decided just to redirect any mobile user by default to m.whatever.com. But realize that for Project Zero, you will have all of the power, and it takes one line of code, to actually solve these problems correctly, to detect what the user is using and redirect them to the right place. Well, what else? Um, kind of qualifies as a mobile app. So there's Gmail. And Gmail is a sort of a genuine, compelling mobile web application. And that makes heavy use of fairly complex JavaScript to really create a nice interactive experience for the user, even if you're not on a very fast connection. If you're on a 3G or Edge connection, even Gmail is pretty good at conveying <coughs> the illusion that things are pretty zippy. So this is the website, um, gmail.com in a phone. This is not uh, the downloadable app that now exists. And so we'll talk over the course of the semester in the context of JavaScript script, how you can leverage techniques like Ajax and asynchronicity to create the experience of seamlessness and interactivity, while in the background, really, you have a lot of caching and a lot of latency happening that's addressing or causing those problems there. All right, so we could uh, play all day with websites on the mobile web, but we'll just use those to set things up. So how do you make one? All right, so this is sort of HTML 101. There it is. This is HTML5. This is what everyone's talking about these days. Um, looks pretty similar to HTML4 and prior, but there are some fancier features, just a couple of which we'll scratch over the next couple of weeks. But over the course of the semester, will you be encouraged to delve into some of the fancier features, among them geolocation, uh, fi figuring out where a user is, uh, local storage, so that you can store actual kilobytes and not just a few bytes of information like you used to be able to only in cookies and a whole range of other features as well. So let's do a really quick uh, demo here. I'm going to go ahead and um, let's say open up something called the CS50 appliance. So just as those of you who are in CS51 this semester might be using, um, and we used this past fall in CS50, uh, the CS50 appliance is a virtual machine, which means it's an operating system, specifically Fedora Linux, that we have pre-installed into a big file that you can download from the, uh, via the course's website. You can then install using a program called a hypervisor, something called VMware Fusion, VMware Workstation, VMware Player, VirtualBox. A whole bunch of options exist, such that when you download the appliance and that hypervisor, tie the two together and double click an icon, voila, you are now running Linux on your own computer inside of a window. So former CS50 students from this past fall are familiar with this. Um, former CS50 students will be glad to hear this version's better, um, among whose features are nice full screen out of the box, such as I just did here, the ability to just move between the operating systems on your computer if you have a Mac. Um, and a whole bunch of other fixes that we've rolled out. So the first project will walk you through the process of downloading this onto your own computer and using it for projects. And among the compelling upsides for us is going to be everyone then is not only using a standard uniform environment so we know what to expect and can help troubleshoot issues, it's also designed to mimic real world web servers. So you will actually have inside of the appliance your own web server running, your own database server running, your own installation of PHP or any other tool that you might want to use. So it's meant to be perfectly representative of of what you would get if you were actually using a corporate server or paying some third party host? Can you run Xcode in the CS50 appliance? Good question. Can you run Xcode in the CS50 appliance? No, because um, the CS50 appliance by nature is Linux. Um, Xcode requires Mac OS. Some Googling suggests that some industrious folks have, in fact, solved that problem using VirtualBox or Fusion or other hypervisors um, by following detailed directions people have posted online over time. Okay, so. I came very close there. All right, so 
Um, let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to go ahead into the following directory here. So,、uh, for those unfamiliar, just assume I'm at a command line on my own computer or on nice.fas.harvard.edu or cloud.cs50.net. And I've in advance created this directory called vhosts, which stands for virtual hosts. More on that in the first project spec. But inside of this vhost directory, 